Hello and welcome. And hopefully as we continue to look through the life of Abraham, you see aspects of God's character which can encourage your daily walk with him as well. And we're up to a, a massively important part of the Old Testament. It's Genesis 15. And we're going to slow down a bit actually when we look at Genesis 15. We're going to spend a couple of days in Genesis 15. And today we're looking at Genesis 15 verses 1 through 6 which in verse 6 has one of the most important passages from the Old Testament into the New Testament. That is, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But to go back a step, I'm going to pause just for a moment where you can now read the text and it'll appear on the screen as well. The text of Genesis 15 verses 1 through 6. As you came to that reading, you would have noticed if you've been following our series looking at the life of Abraham through Genesis 12 to 22, that it begins by referring back to the passage from yesterday when Abraham uh, trusted in God's provision for him and it enabled him to step out in faith and to actually rescue Lot in a war against a number of kings who were terrorizing the countryside. And so God refers back to that at the beginning of our passage today by saying that he is the strength of Abraham. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Just a reminder to Abraham about where he stands. God's keeping his promises to make the nation great that will come from Abraham's offspring, which then sparks Abraham back to the promises that God did make in Genesis 12. The great nation, the blessing that will come to Abraham and the land. And Abram reflects that none of these things can happen really, God, unless you do something about the biggest problem I've got. I don't have an heir from my own progeny. I could inherit a person in the sense of buying a slave and making this person my adopted son. I could also uh, go get Eliezer of Damascus to be the heir. But this doesn't seem to be what you promised, God. What's going on? Uh, you said you kept your end of the bargain, and I saw that with the rescue of Lot. But the key provision that seems to be failing is I don't have anybody to take over from me. And so God continues in that vein in verse 4 to speak about something that will effectually make the promise come true. And it's his power to bring his word into being, which causes us a great dilemma, the same dilemma that it caused Abram. And that is, when you receive a promise of God, which to all intensive purposes looks impossible, it physically is not possible, it does not look, it could ever be the reality of Abram's life, and maybe that is the case for you in some aspect of your life. You've received promises of God for forgiveness, eternal life, love, the promise of God that he cares for his children, and your life is not going so well. And so on the one hand, you have the promises of God, then on the other hand, you have how your life is going. And you're asked by God to believe his promises, irrespective of how your current circumstances are going. That takes faith. It takes belief. And it's a belief not so much in what you see, in what you know in the present, but what you know in the character of God and his power to make it work eternally. And so God continues in verses 4 to say, this promise that I have given you will come true in your own flesh and blood to the extent that if you look at the stars in the sky they are so numerous but not nearly as numerous as the children that will come from your family and Abraham it says in verse 6 believe the Lord and he credit to him as righteousness now a problem that I often have with the word righteousness is I think it means moral character that is I have done the right thing and that is certainly a part of it. But it's not the main part of this particular verse. The main part of this verse is that Abram heard the promise of the Lord, weighed it up against really 
the visible signs of how his life was going. But in the end, he knew the Lord was more faithful than what he could currently see in his own life. He believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. It credited to him as being in a right relationship with God. So it seems that righteousness in this context is to hear the promise of God and to put your trust in that promise. It's to believe God at his word and to trust him with that promise to work through your life. And that is actually how I think Paul takes it in Romans 4. That is, you hear the Lord, you trust in his word, you obey it, irrespective of how your circumstance in life may weigh against that word being true. Now that can be true for us. So I could ask the question, and I might ask this and pause that you may pray about this. What promises of God have you received that you are struggling to believe in? That is, we doubt the promises of God because of our current circumstance. I doubt that God loves me. I doubt that God can forgive me. I want to believe in God, but yet I don't have seemingly enough faith to believe. And the question becomes, do you trust in your own doubts? Do you put faith in those doubts? Or do you put faith in the God who is absolutely faithful to bring his promises to fruition through Jesus Christ in your life? And if you believe in God, believe in the Lord, the Lord credits to, that to you as righteousness because you have heard the word of the Lord and you have believed. Initially, it's through the great promise through Jesus Christ that Jesus saves you from your sin. You have believed the Lord and you'll be counted righteous. Not because you are, but because faith in Christ is what counts. Because it is the power of Jesus to make the promise of God's salvation true to all who believe. Amen.